You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. Warning! This is for entertainment purposes only. Do not take this seriously. This is not medical advice. Although I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor yet. If you want me to be your doctor, click the link in the description box. But otherwise, this is just for fun, kids. Don't do this at home. Greetings, Earthlings. Like, subscribe, and share this video. Share with a friend. Share with enemies. Share with people who think they know everything. Spread it like herpes. It doesn't matter to me. Also, speaking of herpes, I am a medical doctor, and I could be your doctor. That only requires you to click the link in the description box. I can order you blood work. I can read the blood work. I can treat any illnesses. Um, basically it's like an HRT clinic. That's a one man army. Also, I do coaching. Dr. Karina Dodson and I have a coaching business called Apex Coaching. So if you sign up with me, you get coaching, which is nutrition, programming, competition prep, or lifestyle coaching, as well as all the medical stuff. So you have three people, two doctors in one business. It's going to be the contest prep, the nutritionist, the programming person and the doctor all in one. You can't beat it. It's integrated. It works the best that way. You'll love it. Make sure to do it. Click the link in the description box. All right. After all that bullshit, now you get the real video of the day. It's how to get big fucking legs. So this is going to be part one of a, how the fuck should I know many parts of videos, basically about how to grow muscle like i've done all these videos about how to use steroids to grow but chances are the diet's fucked the training is fucked the programming is fucked everything's fucked because i'm a cynic i just go into things assuming that well i actually assume everyone knows what they're doing and then you find out you know there's people out there that think carb is steak i mean that steak is carbs see i even fuck up sometimes but the point is this video is just a very simple approach to how to grow big legs. Mostly, it's not going to be the nutrition this video. It's not going to be the gear this video. I already have a video about that. I'm going to do a video about nutrition soon. It's going to be basically picking the right exercises and why on how to grow big legs and how to program things appropriately. So this video will cover a lot of general concepts so that the uh, this one kind of the long one, then the other ones will be shorter because they'll be assuming you watch them in order. And that never is the case. But the point is, is I'm not going to repeat myself too much later on. This will be the video that you're supposed to refer back to. But you wouldn't know that unless you already watched it. And in which case, you wouldn't have to refer back to it. So I don't know why I'm even saying it. All right. So the most important thing is for you to look at your body or have a professional look at your body and tell you where you need to grow. Now, the big question is, are you a bodybuilder or are you just someone who wants to look big? There's a huge difference that most people never are seen in shorts or short shorts, so their legs don't matter. That's why most guys don't have good legs um, because they don't care. It's not gonna help you get girls or whatever, or look good. The people wear board shorts to cover up how shitty their legs are. Hell, they even have a division for that. So the, but, to bodybuilding, legs are the be all end all because no one else has them. Just 212 and open are the only divisions that are leg dominant divisions. And it's what separates the men from the boys. It's basically um, lets you know how hardcore someone is up here is how big their legs are. So it's how someone who knows what they're looking at knows to how to evaluate someone's um, fortitude would be the best way to put it testicular fortitude i think is something john meadows and Ramy barango have said so with all that being said there's some raw concepts you have to understand so these are borrowed from dr mike israel from Re renaissance periodization and that's raw stimulus magnitude it's the raw stimulus magnitude of an exercise is how much that exercise stimulates growth all right now fatigue is how much how negative the cost of doing the workout. And then the stimulus to fatigue ratio is how valuable that exercise actually is. And I'll give you some examples of this. So raw stimulus magnitude is measured in a few parts, but basically, do you get a pump? 
do you get weaker as you work out? And um, do you feel a good mind muscle connection doing that exercise? There's actually a ranking system he uses is a zero to two scale. And I think there's, or a zero to three scale and there's three components. So a zero is you don't get any pump. A one's a minor pump. A three is a good pump. And a three, you know, a three is an amazing pump. And then mind muscle connection is you can barely, you can't feel the muscle. One's that you can barely feel the muscle. Three is you feel the muscle and that's all you can feel. You can be on fire in another part of your body. You can't feel it. And then there's perturbation, which is how weak are you after the workout? Like you do 10 reps, nine reps, eight reps. And then you go on to do another exercise and you're doing the same as you would if you did it first. That would be like a zero. If you're at like 10 reps, four reps, zero reps, that's perturbed as fuck. Your muscles are very upset that you fuck them up. And that's a good indicator that that tax that muscle here and then. Now, fatigue is a little bit more esoteric. It's do you feel joint pain while you're doing it? And after you do the exercise, are you so fucking tired you don't want to keep working out? And I think there's another factor. But the bottom line is you get the gist of it, is you want a lot of stimulus and a little fatigue to get a good stimulus to fatigue ratio. And that's how you choose for you which exercises are best. And here's the fucked up part. It changes. So you could have a really good SFR movement. And then it doesn't hurt at all. And then six months later, you've been doing it for six months. You're not getting a pump anymore. Your muscles don't give a shit. You haven't progressed in load and you've got sore knees now. Like now it's got a shit SFR. That's when we put it in out of rotation and we rotate something else in that's equivalent. So that there's meta exercises and then there's specific exercises. For example, the squat, when I say squat, I mean a category. I don't mean just barbell back squat. It, it, there's like 15 different squats, but I'm going to go over like the four key ones today. Then there's also hip hinge, which is what people call deadlifts. Well, it's like, what do you mean by deadlift? Is it a conventional deadlift? Is it sumo deadlift? Is it a Romanian deadlift? Is it a glute bridge is actually a form of hip hinge that the glute extension is a form of hip hinge. So there's a hip hinge category. Then there's leg curls and leg extensions. So the, there's the four big categories of leg training. Of course, there's little muscles in there too, like calves, adductors, glute medius. We're not going to even get into that right now. So the big other thing to take in consideration is fatigue factor for the whole, there's localized fatigue and systemic fatigue. So if you're going to focus a priority muscle, like let's say you want to make legs a priority muscle, all right, and that means you're going to put it first, you're going to do it before you do anything else. So it means on day one is you do legs. And if quads is your weakness, you do quads first. If hamstrings is your weakness, you do hamstrings first. That's priority placement. Then there's frequency. You want to be able to at least hit your priority body part twice a week. In theory, if you're going push, pull, legs off, push, pull, legs off, you're hitting everything twice in an eight-day period. Little muscles like biceps, triceps, delts, Calves can get it three times a week, no problem. Abs, big muscles like quads may not recover more than once every four or five days. So a, a simple approach is to not prioritize. If you're watching a video to teach you how to work out, you shouldn't be prioritizing. And you do push, pull, legs off, push, pull, legs off. <clears throat> the reason why you do the legs last in this example is you have a full day to recover. Not every, but here's the thing is some people might want to do like a lot of girls do legs three times a week. They can do that because they're not lifting that much weight. And so they don't have that big of a muscle so that if they're squatting what you curl, that's then they're going to be about as sore and fatigued from squatting as you get from curling. And it means that their glutes are going to recover as fast as your biceps. So that's why they can do glutes three times a week because they ain't moving anything. So that's. And this is, may come across as sexist, but this is after 15 years of experience of working with men and women. Women generally don't take shit to failure. And even when they do, they are not using that much weight. And that some women are very strong. Some women are very hardcore. That is a very small percentage. Um, and I've never seen a woman squat more than 315. Karina can squat 315. She's a badass. But most of the time, women are squatting less than 200 pounds. And most adult men can easily squat 200 pounds if they're taught the correct form and they're stabilized. So that brings up the next point. 
So when, when we talk about fatigue, it's systemic fatigue versus localized fatigue. If you get properly localized fatigue to the muscle, you might be sore the next day. You shouldn't train the muscle again until it's not sore. It, when you stimulate a muscle, it's only going to grow for about three days. So if you're sore for more than three days, you're spending all these resources to recover. You're not growing. So you need to be sore for one day, lets you know for sure you hit it hard enough. You could have hit it just right. Goldilocks, you could have done Goldilocks number of sets and you feel no soreness, but you maximally stimulate the muscle. And had you done one more set, you would have been a little sore, which means you would have grown a little less because resources had to go to repairing and not towards growing. So you want to get to that Goldilocks point by doing this. You get a little bit sore and then you leave it the fuck alone until you're not sore anymore and you're probably good. If you're not, if you want to have guaranteed soreness, then you always make sure that you're at least do one more set. So you're a little sore, but you're never sore for two days. That means you're doing probably too much volume. Now, of course, if you're on anabolics, if you're on GH, this changes shit. But this video is basically for natural people. Assume that gear and GH will improve your recovery and you can still grow while you're recovering. But you still will bet grow more if you're really not recovering. So this video is already 11 minutes long. I haven't gotten the fucking thing. All right. So this almost should be a video about the basic premise of growing, but no one would fucking watch that because like, I know how to grow muscle. I just look worse. So point is, this one I'm talking really fast is because I want you to get through it quickly because i'm sure it's boring as fuck so you want to get localized soreness now here's the thing is you're like well i want to hit legs i want to throw a touch of i'm not sore i'm going to throw more volume at my legs but your total systemic fatigue might go up even if you're not getting sore in your legs you might get worn down you might have a hard time sleeping you may not have much of an appetite you may not be getting pumps in other body parts you may get a cold these are all signs that you have too much fatigue. It means you either needed a deload, or if this, if you're needing a deload every two or three weeks, it means you have just too much total volume. So if you're going to prioritize legs, you have to take sets away from back and chest. Taking sets away from shoulders and arms is kind of pointless. They're so small, they're not going to have any systemic fatigue. The big body parts that are fatiguing are in order: quads, hamstrings, back or and then chest or maybe quads back hamstrings chest so trying to bring up your legs bring up your quads and your hamstrings at the same time you're pretty much fucking off with the whole rest of your week because it's not something you would do you would basically pick one you pick like quads and triceps or hamstrings and biceps and you can bring them up and a simple way of doing that would be to pull with hamstrings push biceps and legs off repeat or push with leg extensions, pull triceps and legs, rip off, repeat. And you're like, whoa, I'll get to that in a second. So this is where we get to the actual meat and potatoes. So we're 13 minutes in, we just got through all the foreplay. Now it gets to the actual leg exercises. So now that we've discussed the basic framework of how to program a split and how to handle fatigue and how to organize volume and localized and systemic volume, of course, I'm going to have to go into a bigger video about this later, but I wanted to at least give you some framework. The best exercises, and that's probably what I should have called this video is best exercises for legs. Yeah, I didn't realize it was going to be this fucking long. So quads, simple. Squat patterns have the biggest raw stimulus magnitude. They also have the most fatigue. If they're hurting your knees, hurting your lower back, or you're axially loaded. What does axially loaded mean? It means the bar is pushed on your shoulder. It has to travel through your spine. That's exhausting. So the best SFR, you get all the raw stimulus magnitude of a squat pattern, but none of the fatigue of the squat pattern is a pendulum squat. Not a, is a belt squat. The belt squat allows you to push back. It's the belt forms a back brace. So you get to extend your legs like it's a pendulum squat. And like a pendulum squat, you've got the back brace, just like a hack squat has a back brace. But with a hack squat, you go basically linearly. And so you're getting a lot of knee. You're getting a lot of quad because the line of force is lined up with your glutes, which makes your knee furthest away from the glutes, which means the moment arm on the knee is the longest, which means the quad does the most work. So the hack squat is what people think is the best quad exercise, but the pendulum squat lets you kick away. So you're getting the advantage that you would get out of a leg extension, which is the only exercise that lets you actually um, work the muscle in the most contracted position and you can hit the rectus femoris. 
making the leg extension used to be a super specialized thing that you would have to do. Like hack squat would be one, leg extension would be two. But the pendulum squat lets you do both. But it's actually loaded. The belt squat, you can kick your feet. You can push away with your feet and push against the back. Um, the band, the belt that goes around your lower back and really isolate your quad. You can hit your middle quad by turning your toes out. You can hit your lateral quad by pushing your feet width widthwise. So there's this to get VMO. There's this motion. You're not really moving your feet like this, but the pressure is in this direction to, in order to hit lateral quad as long as you're pushing back. If you push straight up, the line of force, which is created by the belt, you can see the line of force. Whatever the belt is pointing, that is the line of force. If you move your knees further away from that line of force, you're going to get more quad, but you're going to get more VMO and more distal quad around the knee area. It's also probably going to hurt your knees more. It's going to become more like a hack squat. But if you push back, it's more like a pendulum squat. So that makes belt squat the very best. It has all the advantages of the hack squat, all the advantages of the leg extension, and all the advantages of the, and it's not actually loaded. The next best thing from a belt squat is going to be the pendulum squat. The next best thing from a pendulum squat is a hack squat. Now, if you don't have any of those options, you are resorted to doing traditional squat patterns. The best option then is a Smith machine squat with your feet forward. That the problem with that is there's no back brace. So you can bend yourself in half if you push wrong. And I've hurt myself doing that. That so the Smith squat is after the hack squat for the safety reason of lower back can get involved and you can cheat. You can basically hinge up where your butt comes up first and then you lever. It's not ideal. Then from there, we get even shittier options. Basically, what you would want to do is do a front squat with your heels up on plates or on wedges or in squat shoes. Then the next step back from that is a high bar squat. And the very worst option of all is a barbell low bar back squat. That the barbell low bar back squat is pretty much almost all glute. Your shin is pretty much straight vertical. There's almost no moment arm on your knee. You're not going to get much quads out of that. That's why power lifters have huge asses and no legs is from that stupid barbell back squat. But I know, I know, I know a lot of guys are like, but that's my ego, man. It's like, listen. No matter how much you bench and no matter how much you squat, it does not make your dick bigger. And girls don't know anything about numbers. So if you say, I bench 300 pounds, they're like, that's a lot. That's more than I weigh. I sure as fuck hope so. But if you were like, I bench 350 for eight, they don't even know what that means most of the time, especially if they don't lift. They don't know that it gets harder the more reps you do. And that if you do 350 for eight, you could probably do 400 or 425 for one. It's assuming your joints could withstand that, which they probably wouldn't. All of that, it doesn't really mean anything. That, that, that The girls do not give a fuck about how much. They couldn't even look at the bar and know how much weight's on it. Even, some of the girls who even compete can't do that. So this whole thing about showing off to people with how strong you are is fucking retarded. That you should be doing with legs sets of 10 plus. You probably never should go under 10 reps with your legs. Simple. There's a number of reasons for that. Yes, you will have more um, mechanical tension. Yes, in theory, you will drive more um, growth in the short term. But the amount of fatigue accumulation and how fast the exercise goes stale will be much faster than if you do a 10 to 12 rep range for squat patterns or 15 to 20 for leg press or 20 to 25 for leg extensions. That's a whole nother video explaining whether you want, but basically for the long and the short of it is if you're over 40, you pretty much should be doing 10 to 20 reps. If you're under 17, maybe you can do five to 10 reps and everyone in between it's kind of a toss up. And in the end, it really isn't better. It's just different. And when you're really young, you can get away with the barbell movements at eight, six reps. You probably should never go lower than that. I've seen a lot of teen teenagers hurt themselves a lot. So I, it's I, it's just because you're less likely to get hurt. You're really le li less likely to get hurt if you do 10 reps. So that's why I say for legs, stick to 10 to 20 reps. Anything over 10 to 20 reps, you're going to be out of breath. If any, unless you're doing a shit ton of cardio and I'll do a cardio lecture about th that explaining why cardio is useful in the off season, because it gives you the lung capacity to do legs in the appropriate rep range. 
but still going over 20 reps, the metabolite accumulating screws up the neuromuscular connectivity. So you don't fire as hard. So you're not getting as much force so that the muscle is not getting stimulated the same with the white fibers. So it's still better to stay under 20 reps unless it's something specifically for that, like leg extensions. So the, that's the big and the short of it is people are like confused as fuck. Let me restate this. Belt squats, number one. Pendulum squats, number two. Back squats, number three. Now, what about leg press? Leg press is also not actually loaded. It also is much more common and more versatile than the belt squat. That makes, and that you're back braced, the leg press is great. The problem is to do a set of 10 to 12 with a leg press, you're using so much fucking weight. You're using 1,000, maybe even 1,500 pounds. You're never going to, it takes hours to load the thing and pull it off. Your lower back's fried. It's better as a second movement to do high reps with. So you don't have to use that much weight because you end up feeling it in your feet, your ankles, your hips. It's just too much fucking weight. You're too mechanically advantaged in a leg press to really let loose. That's why you can do those higher upsets. So belt squat, 10 to 12, and then a hack squat. I mean, a uh, leg press, 15 to 20, maybe even more. Another way of doing this is you could do the belt squat or another squat pattern on the second day of the week and then hit leg extensions. Um, something to take into consideration, you might want to do single leg stuff. So either once in a while or on, there's a Bulgarian split squat, there's single leg leg press, and you can do your leg extension single leg. That's pretty much how I do it. To give you an idea, this is a like a leg routine that Luke Miller from J3U had, gave me. It's very simple. I picked my exercises. He told me like how to arrange it because I know my SFRs for my exercises, but he put belt squat, then leg press, medium reps, high reps, and then single leg, leg press, and then leg extensions, single leg, single leg, medium reps, high reps. Simple. So if I do 12 reps on my squat pattern, then I'm doing 20 reps on my leg press. If I do 15 reps on my single leg leg press, then three, four days later, then I'm doing um, 20 reps, 25 reps with a leg extension. And that way I'm getting the fully contracted position with the leg extension, the fully stretched position with the belt squat, the fully stretched position with the leg press, the fully stretched position with the single leg leg press, but I'm getting single leg pressing and single leg extensions, double leg pressing. I'm getting everything covered. Now, that's something else to be said. The fully contracted position stimulates less growth than the fully stretched position. So you want the lift to be maximally loaded in the fully stretched position. You want to do full range of motion, but with an emphasis in the stretch position with a pause at the bottom. So your squat pattern should all be paused in the bottom. Your leg presses should be paused at the bottom. That means you come all the way down really slow, three seconds down, count one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, boom. One, two, three, four, one, two, boom. I have this magnet on my phone. I basically have a stopwatch. I hook the phone up to the machine in front of me. The stopwatch is going. I can count my reps and I can count my seconds of my descent. So it'd be like one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two. One, two, three, three. And I pick music so that the tempo allows for this. So uh, the music, the stopwatch, it's all integrated. Of course, I track everything on a spreadsheet. I'm very meticulous. I'm a professional bodybuilder. You don't also have to do that. If I'm your coach, I'll give you the spreadsheet. I'll help you pick songs, you know, all that shit. But that's neither here nor there. That's just quads. Hams, now, obviously, if your knees hurt, don't fucking do it. Do something else. If your lower back hurts, then probably use the belt squat. You know, like there's all these ways around it. And if you're having issues, get up a console call. The link's in the description box. That's to my link tree. Then in the link tree, the top options console, I will help you. I will work with you and program your shit. And if you want coaching, then that's part of coaching is programming. All right. So hamstrings. Hamstrings are super fucking simple. Ready? Hamstrings are leg curls and hip hinges. That's it. That's the whole of hamstrings. All right. Now, leg curls. The lying leg curl is probably the worst option because you can work the hamstring in its fully contracted position. Great. You should do that. 
It's not the, it's the least important one, though. The seated leg curl it works the hamstring in its fully stretched position with a good amount of weight, but it's still heavy in the contracted position. That makes it my favorite movement, and you're very well braced. The straight leg deadlift is a version of the deadlift that works the hamstring in a stretch position. It's a closed chain motion, so you're, but it requires a shit ton of skill. And fatigue fucks you up, and you probably shouldn't go to failure. And it can you can feel it in your lower back, or you can feel it in your glutes. The difference between the, the deadlifts is where do you feel it? So a conventional deadlift is mostly lower back and quads. Um, Romanian deadlift, it's mostly in the glutes. That's what girls would do to get bigger butt. Straight leg deadlifts, what guys would do to get bigger hamstrings. It's very uncomfortable. You feel this really strong stretch, even if you just come to your knees. And then you use your hamstrings to pull your um, torso up. So with a Romanian deadlift, you push your butt back to make your butt, the hinge, further away from the line of force. The further the butt gets away, the more the glutes have to contract. That's the moment arm we talked about. With the hamstrings, you want to push your knees away from the bar. The further your knees get away from the bar, the longer the moment arm. And so the more tension you have on the hamstrings. That's the slight difference between a straight leg deadlift and a Romanian deadlift. You push your butt back for Romanians. You push your knees back for straight legs. And I also think that people do them from the floor, which is pretty dangerous. If you're not flexible enough for that, you should keep your back straight. And obviously there should be a separate video for a tutorial for the different deadlifts. That's not the point of this. The point of this is just selecting the exercises, not teaching you how to do them. Um, if you want to see good straight leg deadlifts, JP or Justin Shire or Luke Miller have great straight leg deadlift instructions. Um, so uh, I would put, Although you're supposed to do the heavy movement first because you have the most raw stimulus magnitude, so you want to have it fresher so you can get the most out of it. I think because you're working if a hyper stretch position, cold, you can tear it. So for that reason, I think that the seated leg curl should be the first movement and then the straight leg deadlift. And then on a different day, you could do your lying leg curl. And it, maybe if you're doing some other hip hinge or a, a Nordic curl or glute ham raise, those are like a third and a fourth and fifth line exercise. I don't think it's necessary to do two different leg curls in one day. And I don't. So one way of doing it is you could do in one mesocycle, you're doing on a pull on legs one, you've got belt squat, leg press, leg curl. And then on pull two, you've got leg curl, lying leg curl, straight leg deadlift, single leg leg press leg extension. That's what I've got. Luke's a master programmer. He's really good at this shit. I'm pretty good. Luke's really good at the programming. So that's pretty much my leg routine. It works perfect. I've tried it every way possible. The way I usually program people is prevent is safety first. So I usually program people adductors, leg curls, leg extension, leg press, then another leg curl, then a le then a squat then a Bulgarian split squat, then the straight leg deadlifts with dumbbells, then calves. And the reason why I do that is I'm working usually with people that aren't super strong yet. You know, they're leg pressing three, 400 pounds. They're squatting maybe 200 pounds. So they're not going to get that tore the fuck up. And I'm only having them do two sets each. So I want them to familiarize and master all these different exercises. And the order is logical. Um, but I want them to master these exercises. Why don't we put them all in a row like that? Why didn't I put all three hamstring movements, then all three quad movements? You can do that, and that's good for a pump. You get a better metabolite driving force, but you get less mechanical tension. If you if you alternate between hamstring, quad, hamstring, quad, and hamstring, quad, you'll get less of a pump, but you will get more weight. You'll actually handle more weight. You'll be stronger. So you'll get more mechanical tension. More mecha mechanical tension is a bigger driving force over metabolites. This is especially true if you're doing over 10 reps. Now, if we're doing under 10 reps, that's a completely different situation. But if you're doing over 10 reps, this works great because you still are doing enough reps to where you can re-get that pump every time. Plus, water and salt are a big factor in... Um, whether you get a pump or not, more so than carbohydrates. And that's all part of the nutrition aspect of the coaching program. It's like, we will make sure that you're getting a pump by what you're taking in before, during, and after you train so that you're ready for the next workout. <clears throat> as far as all that, I think the donkey calf is the best thing for calves. 
a lot of people under train their calves. And so one thing you can do is just like you can train arms before legs because arms after upper body, like triceps after um, chest or biceps after back are usually, it's a shit workout. But if you do it before legs, you're fresh. That tiny ass muscle is not going to get in the way of your leg workouts. Likewise, if you do calves before chest or before back, that tiny ass muscle does not get in the way of that workout. So if you can do them three times a week, fine. But if you're not, if you're going to do them one time a week, it makes sense to do calves before chest. It makes sense to do triceps before legs. And people are like, that doesn't make any sense in my head. It's like, it doesn't need to make sense in your head. The, what matters is just fucking doing it. Donkey calves is the best because you've got a back brace and your knees are straight. If your knees are straight, you get more gastric activation. If your back is braced, you don't have to worry about spinal loading. A straight leg, I mean, a uh, standing um, calf raise, the, you've got your shoulders loaded. So the spine and your core has to remain tight. It's very tiring to make it through the whole set. You really have stronger calves than you think. And your calves need to do really fucking high reps. They're almost all red fibers. I think the soleus is like 97% red fiber. The gastroc is 79% red fiber. Of course, there's genetic variability, but white fibers respond to lower weight and I mean lower reps, higher weight. Red fibers respond to higher reps, lower weight. Red fibers are more metabolic. White fibers are more mechanical tension, right? So you do metabolite training in calves because that's pretty much the only tissue there. Some people will say, no, you can do sets of 12s with calves. It's like, that's true. You can. I don't get pumps with sets of 12 with calves. And usually, although the pump doesn't necessarily drive muscle growth, it does from stretching the fascia internally and from metabolite accumulation, increasing blood flow. If nothing else, the pump is a proxy for growth because you know you stimulated the tissue enough for it to grow if it got a pump. So if you got a pump, if you're doing curls and you feel and you got a pump in your shoulder and your forearm, but not your bicep, your biceps are not going to grow. If you and on a different exercise, if you get a pump in your bicep, then that's the exercise for you, regardless of what other pros are doing. It's just a fact of the matter. And if 15 reps gets you a pump, but 10 reps gives you sore elbows and sore wrists, then that's not the right weight load for you. Same thing with me. If I do 800 pounds on the calf raise, I get sore ankles. I don't get big gastrox. If I do four or 500 pounds on the calf raise, I get big gastrox. I, yeah, do I have to do 20, 25 reps? Fuck yeah, I do. Does it suck? Fuck yeah, it does. <clears throat> but I'd rather get the pump and just be out of breath doing calves than have a lot of breath and be like waiting around for my next set to start three minutes later. But um, my ankle hurts and I can't do more than two sets. And then I had not do my cardio because my ankle hurts. doesn't make sense. So once you get to a certain level of strength, you're going to have to work higher rep ranges just because your structure is not going to withstand this force that the steroids make your muscles bigger. The steroids do not make your bones and tendons stronger. The GH does, but not as fast as the steroids makes the muscles bigger. So the calves, donkey calves. If you don't have a donkey calf, then I would say there's machines that are kind of like donkey calves or like horizontal versions of donkey calves where your lower back's breaking you know, like a chair and you're pushing your toes away. You could do them one leg at a time, honestly, in those things. That way that the calves come out the same size. Seated calf raises suck because your knee's bent so your gastroc ain't really involved. It's just all soleus. And, you know, it doesn't work your soleus better it just takes your gastric out. So you want to be efficient. You don't want to do seated calf raises. Some people will swear by them. I used to do them. I got a great pump from them, but I got a pump below the gastroc, not at the gastroc. And it's the tape. You don't want a big tube cankle. That's not a cool calf. You want to have the diamond shape to it where it has like the baby's skull and then the dagger coming out of it. And that comes from having a lot of gastroc and some soleus, but the soleus will still get trained when you train the gastroc if you do a lock knee or nearly lock knee position. So standing calves is the third best option and seated calves is the fourth best option. So donkey calf number one, donkey calf like machine number two. Um, standing calves is number three, seated calves is number four, distant fourth. Um, that should be it, man, for calves. Adductors, you use the adductor machine. Yes, you're going to get the adductors if you do wide stance squats. The thing is, is you're going to have a hard time targeting your lateral quad and getting that sweep 
if you're feeling your adductors, unless you go really wide. If you go really wide and low on the platform and the leg press, you can get adductors and quad sweep. If your knees track over your toes a lot, you'll get VMO. And um, that's a lot of personal preference and experience that playing around with your foot placement on the leg press might take 10 years to find just right. And then by the time you mastered it, you got to grow a different part of your quads by that point. Um, I think I covered range of motion. I call it covered tempo. I covered exercise selection. I covered exercise execution. I covered prioritization of range of motion with the stretch position being more important. Tempo is a squeeze is optional. Three second eccentric one to two second pause in the stretch position if there's tension there and then an explosive concentric phase the concentric builds the most and the forces are the highest the faster you go the eccentric builds the second most amount of muscle and the forces are just there's a goldilocks point you can go too slow and lose tension or if you come down too fast you're going to lose tension and then of course if you plummet and then come to a dead stop that's going to snap a tendon eventually so you want to come down slow pause and then explode up. And that pause is tension in the stretch position. That is a very stimulatory for growth. Um, covered everything. Tempo, um, rest periods. Rest periods, especially for legs, you probably want to rest three minutes. Just put a timer on. I've got my timer. I slap it to the machine with a magnet. So it's got the timer, put my shaker cup in the seat, and I do laps so I get my steps in. And then I come back. And if people want to talk to you, you can be like, sorry, bro. That's a three minutes. I got to do my set headphones in go so that way people can sh catch up with you and chit chat with you but they don't get more than two minutes of your time and they don't fuck up your pump and of course they can just sit there and be patiently wait for your set to be over that's always an option but you gotta you the timer gives you an excuse i got that from john Druitt. so i ripped through this as fast as i could i covered adductors hamstrings quads calves i covered all the basic metrics of muscle growth i covered programming prioritization. I covered a shit ton of stuff. I covered like nine videos in this past 37 minutes, but each, if you really hate me now, cause of how fucking long this video took each subsequent video will be shorter because I'll just get to the high SFR movements for back, high SFR movements for chest, high SFR movements for delts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, if you got any comments, leave them in the box, the comment box, the comment section, the comment section, Unfortunately, mine does not have Brett Cooper. Leave them in the comment section and I will answer them. I'm really good about that, better than I ever was. And I'm nice, unlike previous iterations of me. Um, as far as if you want my help, go to the description box. This time I was the correct place, the description box. It'll have a link to my contact tap link link. Click that. There's a whole bunch of shit. The top one's the console. All right, guys. You have a good one. Don't hurt yourself and blame me. It's not my fault. Don't send your angry wives after me because your lower back hurts and you can't fuck them.